Thank you very much for joining us in the today's event on mainstreaming quality and accountability. This event is part of the Regional Humanitarian Partnership event 2020. Uh, the motto is make the decade count. The event is organized by uh, Community for Civil Asia and the regional partnership is co-hosted by Asian Disaster Reduction and Response Network, International Council for Voluntary Agencies and United Nations Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. Before moving forward to the uh, webinar, let me share some of the housekeeping role with you. The webinar is scheduled for 90 minutes. We will have the video feature turned off for the participant. Participant cannot turn on your, their cameras. This is just to ensure good quality. And uh, also the mic is muted by default. This will help enable us to hear us clearly. And uh, during the question and answer session, or if there is the time permits, there is a session to share uh, the experiences. Then we will allow some of the participants to share their views and they can unmute their mic upon the request. You can submit your questions via the Q&A feature. You may also upload each other questions. You may use the chat feature to communicate with us and with each other and share your thought exp expression in the chat feature. We will use the polling feature to ask you a few of the introductory questions and uh, like we did one at the opening and we'll be using another poll later at the end of the webinar. This webinar will be recorded and the recording will be shared with the participant after the webinar in, in, in a week or so. Uh, thank you very much. So let me ask Aisha Hassan, our Associate Regional Director to formally start the webinar. Um, thank you, Huram. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Regional Humanitarian Partnership events. Um, I'm Aisha Hassan and I work with Community World Service Asia. CWSA hosts ADRRN's Quality and Accountability Hub in Asia. Uh, we are Sphere Focal Point and the Regional Partner of Sphere in Asia to strengthen and extend the reach of our commitments to promote quality and accountability in, humanita in humanitarian response and development work CWSA is also a member of Core Humanitarian Standard, CHS Alliance. We actively promote Core Humanitarian Standards, Sphere Standard, and its companion standards in Pakistan as well as in the region. This includes at times we do trainings of NGOs and other civil society organizations. We do also promote memberships, encouraging partner organizations for CHS self-assessment and sharing information about CHS sphere and its companion standards. If I look back at CWSA's journey of mainstreaming, commitment at various levels and consistent effort comes to my mind. Both of these factors we feel is key to mainstream quality and accountability. If at any stage there is inconsistency in efforts to mainstream quality and accountability, problem starts start to pour in. I hope in today's webinar, we will learn from each other that what are some of the enabling factors to contribute to mainstream quality and accountability in any organization. And we will also see that why quality and accountability, what value it adds to our work. I hope in today's webinar, we will get to listen to some best practices and examples from our sector in this regard. Let me introduce you to our webinar facilitator, Ms. Uma Narayanan. Some of you might be familiar with Uma. She has a background in human resource management, accountability, and organizational development. She has been promoting quality and accountability in many disasters in Asia, such as Pakistan earthquake, typhoon in Philippines, Nepal earthquake, Pakistan TTP crisis, tsunami, etc. Uma is also a fair standard and core humanitarian standard trainer, advisor, and she actively advocates for it. She assists organizations in, condu in conducting HR related and sexual exploitation and abuse related investigations. 
Omar champions the use of local and regional resources and has mentored many Q&A practitioners in this region. Please join me to welcome Omar. Over to you, Omar. Thanks. Thank you, Aisha. Can you hear me? Can you see me clearly? Uh, yes, Omar, we can. We can, okay. Kuram, I don't see anyone else on the panel uh, gallery. I, you're muted. Okay, never mind. I will start. Uh, just because of you. Yeah, I can see uh, others as well. Yeah. Okay, so just put the uh, gallery so that I can see others. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I saw from the poll. Uh, 90% of you are from this new region called Asai. I am not from Asai, I am from Asia. <laughs> there was a spelling error earlier on. So welcome everyone. And I see 50% of you are from INGOs and NGOs. And most of you are a member of either ADRRN, ICWA, CHS Alliance, SPHERE. So you are very familiar with the topic itself. Uh, today, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, mainstreaming and Mm. Uh, Kuram, you're showing a poll already. Sent. No. Yeah. I can see a poll on the screen. We don't want the poll now. Okay. Um, yeah, bear with me with some of these uh, technical uh, issues, but um, the purpose of this uh, webinar today is uh, simply to promote the mainstreaming of accountability as a means to increasing uh, accountability to affected population. For many of you, this may not be a very new topic and you probably are already doing some uh, work around mainstreaming accountability in your organization, either formally, informally, in a structured way or in a not structured way. And often you would find that those who are doing ma mainstreaming in a structured way, uh, it takes a lot of effort, it takes a lot of resources. So today we are going to share a few tools and uh, some processes of how uh, some of these mainstreaming experiences has worked for CWSA and for a few other uh, organizations. So I'm very happy to share some of these with you today. Next slide, Kurum. So sit back, relax. Unfortunately, I cannot see any of your faces here uh, at the moment, so I'm not so sure what you're up to, but I would suggest you take it easy. It will be a very informal session. I will go through a couple of slides for about 20 minutes, and I'll talk a little bit about what do we mean by mainstreaming. I know the word sounds very familiar, but sometimes Familiar words uh, may not be what we understand similarly uh, within uh, all of us. So let me share a little bit later when, when I say mainstreaming, what exactly do I mean? And a bit on why uh, we are doing this mainstreaming and some of the steps, which is the how. We will have at least one uh, participant uh, who would be sharing some experiences uh, later on about mainstreaming and at the end of the uh, webinar we will have some question and answer as well as uh, comments and reflections from your side and then I'll hand it over to Kuram and with that I would be ready to start the first uh, formal slide. Kuram can you please go on to the next slide. I will try to watch the chat space uh, as much as I can. I'm not very good at multitasking but I will try. Right. Mainstreaming. When we talk about mainstreaming, and particularly when we talk about accountability mainstreaming, it is about a process. It is about a journey. It is a process of bringing specialized areas into the main flow of our work. So in this case, it is accountability. Most of you may have heard of gender mainstreaming. So similar to that, so if you can recall, how was gender mainstreaming done? What was done some years ago when gender mainstreaming was 
uh, introduced? What, what was the steps taken? What are some of the uh, processes that were put in place? How were things mainstreamed within the organization? And as you know, this effort continues. Gender mainstreaming continues. We still continue to work and promote a lot of areas within the uh, gender aspect. So similarly, we, when we talk about accountability, mainstreaming is not a simple a step, it is a process, it is a journey. It is also a process to integrate accountability into existing frameworks and practices. And when I say that, that means within your organization, whichever size your organization is, whatever your mandate is, you incorporate, you try to uh, link accountability into your practices. And it is also a process to make institutional changes. When we say institutional changes, that means a lot to do with how, what is the vision of your organization? What is your organization's commitment? And for those of you who are CHS members, you may be very familiar when we talk about commitment. What are the commitments? It takes a lot to say that we are committed to accountability. That is institutional changes, okay? And it is also a process to make operational and programmatic changes. And that means, for example, the way that you design your program, the way that you implement the program, the way that you involve communities and the way that you uh, maybe measure the impact of your program, all that would also shift a little bit. All in all, it is a process to increase accountability to affected population. However, it is not only about increasing accountability to affected population, it is also about increasing accountability to other stakeholders, including internal stakeholders. It, uh, I think sometimes the effort or the attention is put a lot, okay, let's make sure that we listen to the communities, let's do this for the communities very well that's really good and that's what we want that's the ultimate aim but not at the expense of compromising for example the the accountability towards the staff uh, for example not paying attention to staff and for example not uh, maybe paying attention to the stress level or staff care and whatnot so i think here when we talk about accountability it it, it is at all levels and it is not only at one specific level and those days when we speak about accountability we use the term uh, bottom up top down and whatnot and nowadays we we are you know, trying to make it a bit more holistic and not only paying attention to the uh, top uh, down type of accountability. And uh, finally, when we talk about mainstreaming, it is not just about numbers. It's not about we have trained 100 people on CHS uh, training. We have uh, sensitized uh, 200 people on sphere training. No, it's not only about numbers. It is what does this number mean to you? It is how accountability is improving the delivery of our service. So all in all, when we talk about mainstreaming, it is about ensuring that accountability is part of your organization's DNA. All right. So next slide, uh, Kuram. And there are a few entry points when you talk about uh, mainstreaming. Uh, sometimes it could be at the project level. And some of you may um, resonate to this, or some of you may think, oh, yeah, this is what we ask our partners to do. So, for example, it could be a step like, okay, let's uh, work with the partners and we want the partners to set up CRM. CRM is one aspect of mainstreaming and you know that alone takes a lot of resources, a lot of effort uh, just to set up CRM. So sometimes uh, certain organizations may not be familiar with the mainstreaming accountability at a holistic, uh, from a holistic perspective and then maybe they start at project level, they are starting let's say a uh, relief project, they are starting maybe a development project and then they set up CRM for that particular project. Through that project, through setting up of the CRM, then they learn, they get more, let's say, uh, information, they get, let's say, complaints, and then they adjust the program, they increase the quality. From that, some organization decide, okay, this is working very well at the project level, we should do it at all the different projects, we should do it at organizational level. Then that is mainstreaming at uh, throughout the organization. 
And then uh, some people, they start mainstreaming through self-assessment or CHS uh, certification process. Some of you may be familiar with this already. Uh, for those of you who are, uh, who are CHS uh, certified, you will know that you have to go through a laborious process if your uh, systems, policies, and practices are not necessarily in place to allow you to reach that uh, certification process, uh, to get that certification. And sometimes this takes six months, a year, two years, depending where you are. And through the certification, sometimes some staff, they go through and say, oh my God, there's so much of work to prepare, a lot of documents to prepare. We need to do this, we need to do that. But maybe the intent is not for mainstreaming, but the purpose, the ultimate goal of the certification is to strengthen the organization so that you increase your accountability towards affected population. So a lot of staff may not be familiar. So, oh my God, we don't want to do the certification. It's just too much work. But without you realizing somehow or other, this is what's happening, the internalization of the processes. And sometimes mainstreaming or uh, the, the entry points for mainstreaming also happens from donors the donor said okay for all your future projects we want you to ensure there is psea let's say policies we want you to ensure crm is included we want you to ensure that um, uh, meal is taken care of we don't want only the uh, traditional monitoring and evaluation but we want to include accountability make sure the project is uh, uh, truly participatory in a meaningful way uh, is the sec safety security taken care of so donor requirements could also be an entry point for you to shift uh, and pay more attention to the accountability maybe previously you wouldn't have paid attention to it for various reasons, it could be because um, it could be because you don't have the resources. It could be because you uh, you you your leadership is not ready. But donor requirement puts a bit of a pressure. Otherwise, you may not do it. And Osama uh, Al Balawi says donor requirement is the most effective entry point for accountability. Maybe because uh, if it is something voluntary. It's not something that organization want to immediately take, uh, take it on. And we can discuss a little bit on the um, barriers of um, uh, mainstreaming accountability. Next slide, please. So feel free to share some other entry points, but these are some of the entry points. Uh, the steps. These are some of the steps of how, uh, for example, CWSA and a few other organizations have uh, mainstream accountability. And as I said, this is not uh, cast in stone. These are some steps of how this uh, mainstreaming is happening. Maybe in your case, it would be different and we would really be happy to hear your examples uh, later. So step one, what we found is we really need to identify what is the problem, what is the context. Now, for some of you organizations, maybe your baseline in terms of the areas uh, or strength in accountability mechanisms or some of the gaps in accountability mechanisms may be different, may be different from one organization to the other. So each uh, organization should first identify the problem and context because no one organization is the same, right? Then the next step would be for you to develop your accountability strategy. What is it that you want to do? What is it that you want to achieve? How is it that you want to increase or improve the quality of your service? This is, uh, this is important. If this is not uh, there, often when you're trying to articulate to the staff, when you're trying to tell the partners, they are not very clear. Okay, where are we going with this? Why are we having all these new processes, uh, all these policies in place? What are we going to do about this? So I think it's very important to have a quality and accountability strategy. What is it that you want to achieve in the next three years, in the next five years around accountability? Who will that involve? Is it involving the donors? Is it involving your partners? Is it involving staff? Is it involving uh, other stakeholders? Is it involving government? Would you do the same way uh, in terms of accountability? Would it be the same for all the stakeholders or is it different? And when you do the accountability strategy, you also engage your leadership. You engage your board members if you have board. You engage your leadership. And without the leadership buy-in, it's often quite difficult to make the change. 
then it will be to clarify roles and responsibilities. So it's not one person's uh, responsibility to do, uh, to do uh, the uh, accountability. And often for those of you who have the title accountability officer or meal in the organization, all accountability related work may be just pushed to this. Okay, so and so will be taking the lead on that. And that is not the case. With mainstreaming, it is supposed to be internalized by every roles, every positions, and you may have one person or a team to facilitate the process because sometimes it's very important to have a facilitation and you may have uh, someone to, uh, to, to support and steer the process uh, in the beginning. But after some time, it should be part and parcel of your organizations, as I said, the organization's culture and the DNA. And I will show you a slide on what could be the different roles and responsibilities uh, within the organization. Then it will be recruitment and selection. And uh, this is also about uh, having external or not external extra expertise around accountability. A lot of you may already have resources or positions uh, related to accountability in the organization, but you may also not have that funding or uh, the resources to have certain position. In our experience, we found that to have uh, positions related to accountability is useful because you have a dedicated person constantly reminding, reminding the management, reminding everyone, we need to do this. Uh, maybe many years ago, you would hear the term monitoring and evaluation officer, but these days you hear meal, monitoring, evaluation, accountability and learning. And that's not only adding accountability and learning, but it is to ensure accountability learning is part of the uh, process. So this is also a recruitment. You would have accountability officer, you would have protection officer. So you need to plan for this. Is this recruitment and selection only when you have funding for a certain project? If it is mainstreaming, you would have dedicated resources, at least for a certain period of time. And then you will prepare the technical expertise. Next slide, Puram. Uh, And uh, the step, the next step is to have plan, very clear plan, how you are going to go through this process, how you're going to change. For those of you who are dual mandated, or for those of you who are single mandated, either humanitarian or development, if it is humanitarian, typically it is quite straightforward. Supposing you take a CHS assessment or CHS certification, and you make some of these changes at organizational level, but also at programming level, Usually those from humanitarian sector, they can uh, relate very easily because most of these um, uh, certification or standards, they are relating to um, humanitarian assistance. But those from development, they cannot. They cannot. If you go to uh, HR, if you go to finance, what, what, what do you mean? Why do we need to do this? What, what does that, how, how, know, uh, what, is, uh, what does this have got to do with us? with our work. So it will be easier for you to convene some of the program people, the ones who are in the forefront, but not necessarily the ones who are non-programmed, the ones who are support staff. Why, why should they be uh, increasing the accountability in what sense? Particularly if those, they do not have enough contact with the communities, they may not understand. Often what I find is in organization when we do this mainstreaming, uh, each organ uh, each uh, function, each position's role is not clear, so they don't have that ownership towards mainstreaming and towards uh, improving the level of accountability. Then once you have got the plan, you introduce and you revise the system, you revise the policies, you revise the processes within the organization. And after that, once the policies are, are revised, so for example, you may have CRM policy, for example, you may have a, a PSEA related policy, for example, you may have procurement policy that has included a lot of accountability, for example, you may have a HR policies, maybe your job description is uh, also changed to include accountability component. Now, once you've done all that, then you have to train staff, you have to train staff on what is accountability, what are some of the changes that we are going to go through, and also what do we expect of staff to behave a bit differently. So this takes a lot of time, as you can see, and then it will be the implementation uh, stage. The last step uh, would be monitoring whether you are doing well, how well you are, and how you're going to measure uh, the changes. 
Uh, Kuram, next slide, please. One more slide and then, uh, okay. So before I go to the uh, other slide, I would like to uh, invite uh, comments. I would like to invite you either to write in the chat box or you can verbally ask, what do you think are the barriers to accountability mainstreaming? Don't, don't worry about the word mainstreaming, it's just to increase accountability in organization. Think about it that way. So what do you think are the barriers? Why a lot of organizations or some organizations are still struggling to strengthen accountability at different levels? Please feel free to write on the chat box or if you have any comments please raise your hand and I will let uh, Kurum to handle it. I'm just going to give you 10 seconds. Anyone raise hands? Okay two participants raise hand. Uh, Kurum could you please? No buy-in from management absolutely. Culture, uh, culture of the community and the organizations, lack of resources and trained staff, various expectations. <laughs> that is true, various expectations. Some departments, as I mentioned, may not feel so relevant. Political commitment. I'm not so sure what that means, but uh, if you can explain a little bit more. Okay, so we also work in so many different contexts and settings, so different culture, which makes it very mm -hmm. challenging. People understand accountability differently, yeah? and the way that you need to start is also quite different. Commitment, project duration, very true. Sometimes you have that uh, funding for a certain time during the project. Program staff think these increase their workload. So true. When we did some uh, mainstreaming, everybody was running away from <laughs> mainstreaming and they say, oh my God, this is additional work. And I think this is interesting because staff do not see or at least they were not made to understood, understand that this is in the future, it will make things easier. In the future, it will make things uh, better. Lack of enthusiasm, <laughs> I like that one, to achieve Q&A, yes. Language can be a barrier, very true. Fear of job loss. So someone says fear of job loss because you don't want to question. Sometimes accountability is about questioning your status quo. You don't want to question your boss for making a mistake or you don't want to question certain processes. Then you, you know, you, you keep away and you, you're afraid that you will be uh, marked or you're afraid that you will uh, fear, uh, you, you fear job loss. And this is interesting in an organization where accountability is very high, this fear, this suspicion, this mistrust is lesser and lesser. Okay, so that's why I'm a big uh, promoter, supporter of mainstreaming, because I think it makes work more pleasant for us to go as it is our work is very stressful. Huh? Program staff is not very cooperative to get a feedback from community, which is true. Uh, confused responsibility, think that this is for protection and meal. Okay, lack of funding, staff turnover, yes. You train and then they leave, okay, and tell me about it. I've trained many people and they have left. Lack of staff capacity, yes, uh, to ensure accountability in the project management cycle. Time consuming. Uh, lack of transparency. So these are combination of factors, as you can see, um, uh, between uh, resources related barriers, uh, organization culture, leadership related barriers, as well as uh, other factors, external factors like the culture, the community, the behavior and whatnot. Additional workload to have compliance. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for writing it. So you can definitely relate to uh, the, the challenges to mainstreaming and you can see why uh, mainstreaming is not so easy and that you can also see why some organizations don't want to be certified and don't want to uh, put the resources for certification. I think it will be great if success stories are told more often so that people would be encouraged, organizations can be encouraged that maybe the starting point, the process can be a bit tedious, a bit challenging, but the end result is 
something to look forward to and something which would benefit many different levels of uh, the organization, not only internally, not only staff, but the community and other stakeholders. So I think this is something that we can continue to think about. And let me just take a look. Okay, and someone said that uh, very difficult self-assessment process from Q&A perspective, it is true. It's not very easy for us to uh, go internally and ask, what are we doing right? Is this right? Is this wrong? And often we do have our own biases when we do the assessment. And reaching out for communities, Faya says, you know, for awareness on accountability so that we can hear their voices. So all these, for those of you who are looking at the chat also, Thanks for some of these questions, uh, some of these comments. I'll go to the next slide. And Kurum did not let anybody talk, so I will leave it at that. I can't even see my own face, Kurum, but never mind. <laughs> next slide, please. <laughs> next slide, please, Kurum. So let's look at the different uh, roles and uh, different functions. This is not an uh, exhaustive list. This is something just very simple. As you know, I think some of you who know me, I don't like to overcomplicate things. Um, just keep it simple. So what I often uh, realize and notice when we talk about mainstreaming, uh, the different roles that uh, organizations within the organizations are as such like leadership. One of the biggest role is to allocate resources, either financial resources, human resources, technical resources, and they are setting the direction, setting the policies, and also model accountability behavior. This I find very difficult because sometimes the leadership say, yes, let's do this, let's do certification, let's uh, uh, increase the accountability, let's uh, do all the paper filling, uh, do all the requirement, but not necessarily modeling a behavior that is accountable. So modeling behavior that is accountable for me is very crucial when we are doing uh, uh, mainstreaming and creating the accountability culture. As you mentioned, quite a number of you mentioned, the barrier is that the culture how can you change culture within a day? How can you change the culture within a month? It's not possible. You need to have some setting the tone, some setting the direction from above, and then you will see the change in the culture. Sometimes the change in the culture can start from below. It can, it can start. You can get some pressure from maybe certain projects, certain uh, field offices or communities, and then you inherently change also the way that you look at uh, accountability. So leadership role is very crucial. Secondly, program. And, and uh, we, we, when, we, when we talk about leadership, it is also where organizational responsibility, for those of you who are familiar with the CHS um, standard, they talk a lot about organizational responsibility. So without uh, leadership support, it's a bit difficult to get that organizational responsibility program typically they will implement accountability in program they make the changes and some of you have mentioned sometimes program do not adjust the program they do not want to get feedback how can you improve how can you increase the delivery of service and share examples of best practices uh, mostly program they do that and operations when i say operations is also uh, those who are, are non uh, program uh, on uh, for example this includes uh, logistics admin procurement they are also introducing a lot of uh, let's say processes policy systems to ensure that accountability in place is in place so you don't you know give the tender uh, to someone that you like you ensure that at least the tenders are the three people who are submitting the tender but nowadays, even with some mechanisms in place, you still see favoritism. You still see that maybe they already decided what uh, who's going to get the tender. But for the sake of applying, everybody applies. But then uh, there is no transparency. So this is very important within the operations. And we also make changes based on our feedback. Finance, I think finance, uh, their role would also be to budget allocation for accountability to ensure financial donor commitments are met anti-fraud and uh, auditing all these are related to accountability so i would like to invite you not to see accountability as a separate thing a lot of the processes a lot of what you do within the organization are related to accountability the systems the processes the policies the mechanisms all these are related it is about 
how to tie it all together and how do you do it in a way that you increase the accountability. HR, HR, uh, you may already have staff that are necess not necessarily very accountable, but in the future, while training the staff to increase the accountability and changing the culture, it's also to hire staff who are accountability compliant. You hire, when you do your interviews, you should ask accountability related questions. You have to build capacity on accountability. You have to revise HR policies, pro procedures, for example, that is more competency based, uh, which would also be helpful. Meal, uh, meal processes in integrate accountability, help set up maybe a accountability mechanism, complaint mechanism. So you can see each one of the functions, each one of the departments in the organization, they have a crucial role to play. Until and unless each one of these positions and uh, departments come together, you will not get this internalized effect of mainstreaming or accountability. Okay, right, I'm just checking the chat. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, before that, one more, and then I will, one more slide, and then I will go to this, right. I want to, there are many resources. Uh, if you look at uh, CHS Alliance uh, website, there'll be quite a lot of resources. Uh, there are two uh, guidelines. Uh, this was developed by IRC. And at that time, they started a project uh, or initiative called Client Responsiveness. They called the communities or the people that they work client because they felt that uh, it's more powerful rather than calling them beneficiaries as such. I don't know if anyone from IR, for IRC is in this uh, webinar today, but two pieces of work was uh, developed and I was involved in one of that. One is a guide for uh, client responsive staff management. Basically, how can HR uh, make some of the changes within human resources in terms of the processes, system policies to increase accountability? HR is the enabler to increase accountability. If you don't change my job description to include accountability, if you are not going to check my performance on accountability, how am I even going to pay attention to accountability? So you need to make all these changes. So this guide, and Kuram can share it uh, in the chat, it's just about 15, 20 pages. It has um, a complete cycle of human resource management from the recruitment, selection, orientation, performance management, and how uh, you can include accountability. You can modify it to suit your own, uh, let's say, context of the organization, but I feel that uh, resources like this would be helpful and not for you to reinvent the wheel. The second one is also quite interesting. It's a resources about uh, how to measure accountability, which is very difficult. You put in so much of effort on accountability, training, CHS, training sphere, training this, training that, but how do you know that you, the organization is making a difference? How can you measure accountability? How can you say that this is where we were and this is where we are. So some effort was put on um, measuring accountability and this is like a framework. What is it that we need to pay attention to when we are talking about measuring accountability? For meal uh, people and some management, you may be very interested in this particular uh, guide because uh, it's not mm, that uh, abundantly available. Uh, the last I checked, uh, there are not that many resources on measuring accountability. Uh, Kuram, could you please share those uh, two guides? And that will be my uh, little gift for you today. It's not even mine, it's open source, it's from IRC, but I like these two guides. Uh, for the next session, let me just check the time. Right. Next, I would like to uh, take a short pause here before I call uh, Rizwan to share some experience. Is there any question or comment before we move on? Puram, could we hear someone's voice, please? I, I, I feel it's only you and I in the webinar. Yeah, if any of the participants would like to share any- I can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bonaventure raised her. Yeah. Bonaventure. Sorry, I didn't let know. Me, how to let me take it. on. Yeah. 
on the microphone. Yes, Mona, please speak now. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Not so clearly. Not so clearly. Okay, let me do it. Properly? Yes, it's better now, but. Is it clear now? Oh, yes, and I can even see some people's face, finally. All right, come on, Mona, I can hear you now, go on. Great, thank you very much for your presentation and your, the, the way you presented the, the, uh, the how to mainstream the, the quality and accountability. When I was listening to you, something that I wanted just to update uh, the uh, participant on is about the uh, self-assessment. Somebody mm -hmm. said, uh, yeah, it might be uh, difficult to, to ask uh, your staff or to, on the way you are doing it. I just wanted to say we have uh, updated the CHS uh, self-assessment tool in the way to make it very easier for organization to do. It's completely based on uh, a survey. So that, that is done in a way that uh, you don't need to invest a lot of time, but a, uh, each of the staff can take some time sometimes, uh, uh, to answer key questions that will be gather, uh, gathered to have a, a, a sense of where the organization are. It's just to contribute making it easier and uh, 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 taking out this complication of ourselves asking staff about its doing. The staff can go, can answer um, the, the survey and provide uh, meaningful uh, and uh, reflection to the organization to, to move forward. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bona, you're from CHS Alliance, yeah? I am from CHS Alliance, yes. Okay, by any chance, would you be able to just put that uh, self-assessment uh, on the, either the link I will, or sorry, on I, the, in the chat box, just so that uh, people can access it, access it immediately. Great, Sometimes, I will. Sometimes, you know, <laughs> people, we forget. <laughs> After this, we may forget. So put it there. Thank you so much. And, yeah. I, and, I, and I think it's really important that tools like these are made simple and so that it's meaningful. No point in making all these laborious, difficult uh, tools that even you can't understand. How can you change if that is the case? So I'm very happy that uh, uh, CHS is being accountable, listening to the members and have made the changes to the self-assessment. Rizwan is staring at me and saying, I want to speak now. So <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, today we have Rizwan, uh, who is the Global Quality and Accountability Officer from ACT Alliance. You continue to ask the questions and comments after this. Let me give the floor to Rizwan because he's got a lot of experience uh, on mainstreaming. Rizwan and I worked a lot on mainstreaming and there were times we were so traumatized by mainstreaming, we have recovered. I'm sure Rizwan has recovered. Rizwan, go ahead. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, colleagues, regarding to the time zone you are in. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Uma and uh, CWSA, for giving me opportunity to speak and share some experience around quality and accountability at this platform. Uh, I hope you can uh, hear my voice and uh, uh, it's clear, uh, though sometimes due to technology, the uh, voice can go fast or even I speak because English is not my first language. Okay, so uh, in my conversation, short conversation, I will be referring to one of the key aspect, which is uh, uh, shared responsibility. Because as per my experience, I see that uh, accountability is not one person's responsibility. So in my conversation, I will refer to some of the experience that how we try to achieve towards having shared uh, uh, buy-in from the team members or at organizational level or project or program level. So I will be referring to the uh, uh, to some of those experiences. So the first thing uh, to gain the shared uh, uh, responsibility, because I was working with Community World Service Asia for eight years before I joined the ACT Alliance. So what we did that, uh, first of all, we build the capacity of the team members uh, who have the specific role in quality and accountability, as well as broader 
uh, teams as well. So it enabled them to understand that what quality and accountability means. So the capacity building, I see it very important and it really benefited us because then people were able to link quality and accountability specific to their roles, specific to their projects and specific to their programs. And for that reason, we uh, used in-house capacity building or trainings as well, as well as we also uh, sent uh, colleagues or key people uh, to outside external trainings as well from at that time, I remember that back in 2011, it was HAP standard. So people joined the HAP trainings on complaints on, uh, on uh, general uh, HAP standard as well. So that we also used. But at the same time, because I know that some of the organizations may not have uh, the uh, uh, expertise or may not allocate resources. So what we also use that we also benefited a lot from the online training courses as well. So I would uh, really encourage that uh, even considering this post COVID situation where one-to-one -one or face-to-face -face trainings are not possible. So we should benefit from very good courses at Disaster Ready. We have Kayak Connect, we have Fabo.org, which is also an act uh, learn platform. So this, these really help you to have staff understand that what quality and accountability is and how you can build their capacity. Then second thing, how to you can uh, bring shared responsibility is as Uma also mentioned that uh, having uh, uh, the roles related to quality and accountability reflected in the job description of the staff so that uh, you can also uh, uh, make them able to think that this is something which is which they are responsible for. So these staff can be from your uh, monitoring, evaluation, accountability, and learning, but also what role HR staff has in quality and accountability, what role the program development unit has, what role the program implementation units have uh, at field level or at managerial level. So if you reflect those things, then it also makes them think that, okay, this is how we can contribute to improving the quality and accountability at organizational level, as well as the project level. Then it should also be linked later to the appraisal mechanism. What we did at Community World Service Asia that uh, uh, we used a framework from CHS Alliance, which is called Core Humanitarian Competency Framework. So we have incorporated that framework, which lists that, okay, these are the quality and accountability aspects that uh, uh, you need to make sure that these competencies need to be in your staff members. So in relation to the uh, job or role of the people, we have included those uh, key elements or uh, uh, competencies in the job description. And then it was later on uh, reflected at, uh, at the appraisal mechanism as well. So it was also very helpful in order to see that, okay, how uh, the staff is contributing towards quality and accountability and what uh, uh, additional uh, aspects they need to consider for the next year. Then uh, another, uh, uh, as per my experience, uh, we also, uh, as Uma also mentioned on the step six of the quality and accountability mainstreaming is having an action plan. So these action plan, like uh, in Community World Service Asia, we developed three months to six months action plans uh, with each team, considering the work they are doing and consolidating the findings from monitoring visits, as well as uh, discussing with the teams like, okay, what are the areas they need to improve on? For example, if there is something they need to improve on uh, communicating with the communities, they need to improve on staff capacity, they need to improve around complaints mechanism. So they keep uh, reflecting those things in the, uh, in the action plans. Okay, within three to six months, these things will be uh, updated or these things they will be, these actions they will be taking on. So these plans for Rizwan you are breaking maybe you want to turn off the video if that helps
were not only used by the same team, but also the monitoring team whenever they go to uh, as part of their regular monitoring visits. Okay, sorry, Rizwan, your so, voice is breaking. I think I lost connection in between. Yeah, maybe you want to turn off the uh, video. Uh, can you hear me now? Let yes. me put off my video yeah. so that maybe it will help. Yeah, go on. Is it better now? Yes, it's better. Okay. Go on. Uh, I'm not sure where I, I was dropped, maybe around the action plan when I was speaking. Yes around the action plan and the monitoring. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, thank you. Sorry for uh, being with me due to internet uh, disconnectivity. So basically I was saying that uh, uh, we need to have an action plan which, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which helps to you to monitor that uh, where you are uh, and where you are progressing so that it's also referred by the teams as well as uh, a monitoring team as well as if you are uh, 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 if your management want to look at uh, the progress they can also refer to this as well so this is very uh, important to have some kind of uh, action plan so that uh, where you can see the progress as well uh, then another thing that uh, i as per my experience is uh, also uh, in relation to the uh, uh, Mating the change, mating the change. So here I would like to share with you uh, one of my experience from the typhoon Haiyan uh, back in 2013, uh, which happened in the Philippines. So uh, where me and Umma, we worked together and, uh, and where we were deployed with uh, one of our uh, uh, partner organization, LWR. So uh, the experience on having the shared, uh, uh, on taking everyone on board or having, achieving the shared responsibility, one of the tools that helped us was uh, a joint audit, uh, joint audit tool. So basically what we did that uh, we uh, designed a joint audit activity or joint audit uh, uh, tool so that uh, we can take uh, different uh, staff on board and then we instead of being us as a monitor or Q&A uh, saying us as a Q&A uh, experts so we took one person from the program team we took one person from the uh, uh, monitoring and evaluation of that project and one of the Q&A experts so we had to visit several projects from different partners so we made a mixed team so that they themselves see the compliance around sphere minimum standards. Uh, and then we uh, did that. Uh, we designed the questionnaires together. We designed the whole uh, plan and uh, we designed the whole activity. And that really helped us, uh, especially uh, uh, for each one of the team member in order to link that what quality and accountability is and they can then also uh, find out the strengths and areas of improvement at the field level. So this audit tool is uh, documented and it's available on the Sphere website as well. And uh, we can, uh, I can uh, request Khuram to share with you as well. So it also helped us, uh, all the team members in order to link quality and accountability to their work. So uh, now I would uh, just uh, conclude uh, with, with my final remark that even if we are not able to fully meet quality and accountability standards, it is very important that we monitor them and we report them for the purpose of improving uh, uh, in the later stages. So I think it's very important that uh, we monitor those changes. And even if we are not, uh, it's not that uh, we should feel dissatisfied, okay, like we are not 100% complying or we are not doing good, but we should aim to improve on and we should report uh, what is there for the purpose of future learning and improvement. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rizwan.
Kura, am I back on? I can't. Yeah, Omar, you are back on. Yeah. And there is one one participant, Ibran Kazmi, who raised hand. Should I okay. uh, do? Sure. Do we have time? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yes, we do. Uh, thank you, uh, Rizwan. Bring back uh, some memories about our work. And joint audit can uh, sometimes also be referred to as peer assessment. And this works if the peer organizations are genuine and open about it. Uh, then it, it makes the process uh, more, uh, let's say, uh, interesting, but also valuable. And I like the fact that you mentioned about shared responsibility. So for me, I think that would be the takeaway to be shared responsibility. Okay, over to you, Kuna. You can put some comments or questions. Okay, Imran, if you'd like to share anything or want to ask anything, you can now speak, yeah. Yeah, can you hear? Yes, yes. we can. Okay, thank you very much uh, for organizing this very useful uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Imran Kazmi and I'm working with Huendo Core. Uh, uh, and thank you for Rizwan for highlighting uh, the capacity building uh, issue. Uh, you know, NPOs are all non-for-profit organization. They do not have extra resources for staff capacity building. Uh, donor mostly INGOs do not allow capacity building or institutional development of the organizations in their budgets. When they uh, exclude uh, the capacity building line from the budget proposal, even they do not support head office cost. So my question is how institution uh, can be strengthened to ensure quality and accountability. Thank you. Okay. Anyone would like to respond to that, Rizwan? Do you want to take that on? And if anyone else uh, want to comment, you can comment on that question also, and I will respond to it shortly. Rizwan, do you want to respond to that? Yes, sure. Sure, I can do that. Uh, I can share with you some from my experience that uh, how we, uh, because uh, I understand that capacity building uh, is not, it takes a lot of resources and definitely uh, it's not every time possible to organize three day, four day training because it definitely costs a lot. But uh, as I mentioned that uh, uh, there could be different ways, like uh, one could be you, you can uh, get your one staff train and then you can have his or her responsibility to train others. But at the same time, one of the important thing which we learned in the post COVID situation is there are many online learning resources available. So for example, at uh, Disaster Ready, at Kaya Connect, at PHAP. So there are many different webinars, many different e-courses that uh, could really, you can benefit. And uh, for, as per my experience, currently there is so much uh, different knowledge. The important thing uh, is really like uh, you, need to, you can also uh, see that which resources are more relevant to you. It's something that you can find out. And then uh, as per my experience, beside uh, having the trainings, sometimes these small uh, working groups, they are also very helpful in terms of building the capacity. So for example, in Pakistan, uh, uh, we established uh, one of the uh, learning and working group, accountability learning and working group. So that group also facilitated in terms of sharing experiences with different organizations among themselves. So I think that can also be something beyond like just organizing a specific training. You can also benefit from the experience of uh, people from uh, different organizations who are part of these different working groups or different uh, uh, aspects. And uh, if uh, you need any support, like in terms of identifying the quality and accountability courses that, uh, that we can also uh, help because at CWSA website, uh, under their Q&A hub, they have uh, identified the key courses around quality and accountability, which could be beneficial for anyone. So they have shortlisted those courses. So I would suggest that you can also uh, refer to them. Okay, thanks Rizwan. And please uh, give the link uh, in the chat box. Someone is asking for that. 
So Rizwan is talking about uh, building capacity in terms of knowledge, in terms of skills and trainings. And sometimes you may not need that much of resources. But when we are talking about mainstreaming, it's not only knowledge and skills building. It's a lot of other things that may require additional uh, resources. But sometimes uh, it's not only about resources. It's more about the willingness to change. It's more about what do you do within the limited resources? I um, sympathize with organizations that do not have dedicated resources. However, uh, let me play the devil's advocate also. Sometimes some of those who are giving the resources, the question is we have supported so long, so much to some organizations. We have provided training, we have provided capacity, but we are not seeing change. How long should we continue to support? And I think the point is, I go back to what we mentioned earlier, accountability is our internal commitment also. Of course, it can work if there are additional resources, but if organizations who are, who are uh, lacking in resources show more commitment, take some small steps to make the changes, then possibly there will be more uh, support coming uh, your way. I think that that's uh, from my humble experience. I'm going to ask um, Kiran raise the hand and then Kuram, I think one or two more raise the hand. Kiran, Peter, did you raise the hand? Can you say, uh, do you want to? Yeah, Kiran, if you want to ask. Good, good afternoon. Uh, yeah. Please. yeah, I'm talking, can you hear me? Yes, Kiran, go on. Yeah, thank you, Uma, for conducting such a good session. And we have learned a lot about mainstreaming uh, quality and accountability uh, subject in our organizations. Uh, so I, I would like about my organization as well for our society. Uh, it's, uh, and we are working for, uh, like for the poor people here. Who, who, do, who are suffering from poverty and who are suffering from various issues like uh, wash and environment. And uh, uh, we are having a separate uh, meal department here. And on monthly basis, we generate reports, meal reports uh, on the observations, which they, uh, you know, they do monitoring and evaluation of different projects, and then they develop action plans in those reports. So uh, we are having that. But I like the responsibility metrics, which you shared that every department should have their, uh, their responsibilities to incorporate quality and accountability, uh, you know, roles. So uh, that was excellent. And thank you very much for conducting the session. Sure. Kiran, uh, that was a guide. Huh? So you can work on the matrix or you can discuss Hello? what, uh, uh, can you hear me Kiran? Okay, while- Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. So I'm saying when you look at the roles and responsibilities, one way would be to have the different programs, departments come together and ask also, what would be their role in uh, increasing accountability? What would they do to make the change uh, in the department for the organization? So some uh, level of engagement would also increase ownership so that the uh, different departments can uh, work on the changes uh, in simultaneously. Okay. Uh, Kuram, any other comments or questions? There is a one question and uh, interesting one in the Q&A box. It's from Shahid. Uh, he is saying that uh, development work, especially advocacy on certain issues for poor marginalized has different dynamics in which it, it is sometimes impossible to fulfill several of CHS commitments. Though sometimes align, aligning development intervention with the CHS commitment are possible, but not at all times. Okay. This, yeah. Basically, okay. the question is, for the development practitioners, it takes time to make relevance to the CHS, and why there is not serious effort in developing some framework for the development intervention separately. Right, right, right. So I think, uh, yeah, I've read the question also. Excellent question. Uh, I have my opinion. Bona, would you like to try to answer that question? So his question is, 
um, why there's no serious efforts. Now he's really upset now. Why is there no serious effort to develop framework or to focus more on development uh, interventions? Uh, instead, the focus is always on humanitarian assistance. Bona, I let you take the question and then I will give my thought. Great, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, Bona, go ahead. Well, this is a very good question. This is very interesting because um, since the, the launch of the CHS, uh, the word in the CHS, the edge of the CHS have been uh, uh, discussed. Many people ask about that. Why do we focus on the edge? I have to say that in the process of the development of the CHS, that, that was made for first for humanitarian organization. That the edge was very important to link it to the uh, humanitarian principles, but in the in the reality, what we see is searches is applied by uh, development organization as uh, as well as humanitarian organization. Many of the organization being verified and applying the searches are uh, dual mandate. And then, if you look at the reports, are the are the uh, activities humanitarian and development activities are being covered. So. And the feedback we have from our uh, organization applying the searches, searches is completely applicable to development um, uh, activities. It's true that the name and the language in the searches uh, document is very much humanitarian focused, but in practice it's, it's um, being applied by, uh, by organization uh, doing a development uh, um, activities. I want to come back to another uh, uh, aspect of the question saying, it's difficult for our organization to meet the CHS commitment. This is another uh, very important area we are working on because the, the aim of the, the CHS is, we know these are commitments we are making to uh, affected people, people who are, 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 we are working for. But we also know that it's not, uh, from one day to another, we, we will all uh, meet that. So we, we, we take the CHS verification, all the support around it as a learning and improvement process. What is very important for us is to have a clear idea on where do we stand today and what are the plans for us to improve. So this is where the verification process is very strong and powerful is to help organizations to know where we are, how can and, and, uh, set up how we can move from that point to another point. It's a, it's a, a quality, I, I would see quality and accountability as a journey uh, we, are, we are going through. And then we will see in maybe in few years, how do we reach that? I have, I have to say, if you have seen the humanitarian accountability report uh, to, uh, 2020 that have been launch in October, you will clearly see how we are using the verification data to, set, to see where we are and advocating for how, what we should do to improve ourselves. So it's a journey. I think the first thing is to try to know where we stand today and commit to improve. This is what I, I can say for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bona. Just to add to what uh, Bona was saying, I do a lot of CHS training and these questions have come up several times. And sometimes the fact is humanitarian, sorry to use the word, but is also more sexy and there's also more funding for humanitarian. Let's face it, it's more tangible. It's more tangible to say we've saved 300 people, we've done this, we've done that than maybe some of the development related uh, work. If you look at the uh, CHS standard, it talks a lot about organizational commitment, organizational responsibility. So changes, uh, it may be humanitarian focus, but the expectation of the commitments is for organization. It is organizational responsibility policy. So that is not only for us one part of the organization, but it is for the overall part. So it is still relevant to development. It's just that I think uh, it is not maybe articulated as such, number one. Number two, some of the trainers uh, may not be so uh, familiar with how to use the commitments for development purpose. So for example, we struggled a lot 
when uh, the team from capacity building is asking, how do we use this commitment uh, on participation? Or how do we use this in our training? What, what, what are you talking about? So I think it's more about tailor-making and to give some clear examples so that uh, you see the relevance of these standards in all the work that you do. So that's why I think it's very important when we talk about accountability, you need to understand what's the gist and then you need to contextualize it to suit your own needs. Okay, don't overcomplicate things. Huh? Su Tong. So there's one a question from Tong Su, Amiti Foundation Hong Kong. I uh, would like to hear our views about how to best achieve transparency and accountability with all sorts of restrictions due to COVID, travel bans and whatnot. So this, I think, has been uh, discussed uh, quite a lot in terms of um, uh, transparency, accountability during these restrictions. Uh, if some of you have any uh, response to this, please feel free to write on the chat, uh, in the chat box about the restrictions. And for me, um, uh, Tong Su, what I'm thinking is, is also a test about accountability, a proper accountability and transparency. If we are working with the communities, can the communities actually give us some of this information? If we are working with partners in the field, can the, are the partners empowered to, to actually do the work and can do they uh, have that capacity to actually report back and give us what we want? Or is it that always we have to travel, travel, travel to look at some of these um, changes ourselves? So I think it's about uh, if for me, the answer is if the accountability and the uh, involvement of different stakeholders is not high, then organizations will suffer a lot because they are depending on themselves to go and collect the data and to get all the answers. So I think this is a bit of a test case to uh, strengthen the work with the, uh, with the different stakeholders and to increase a particip a participation. This is also in line with localization, nationalization, where we expect those who are in the front line to be more empowered and to do the work and those who are maybe a little far away to support where we can. So I think in this sense, it's, uh, there's no straight answer. Every organization is struggling, but quite a number have put some mechanisms to make these uh, changes. I can give you one example, uh, what I am going through uh, personally at the moment. We were supposed to do some um, evaluation, which requires traveling. And you know, when we do evaluation, we have to go to the communities to check, to ask questions. So that has changed. And instead of physically going there, then I have looked at some, uh, counterparts from the country, from the area, then I train them and then I tell them, this is what I want you to ask. Sometimes I join the discussion over the phone, over the um, uh, Zoom, and then I will uh, get the data. And sometimes maybe the quality is not so strong because they are not trained. Then I just hear from them, okay, give me verbally. What did they say? How did they say? Then I work around it. So I have to change also the way that I work without compromising the quality too much, but we have to look for different, I suppose, different ways to uh, to ensure that uh, we get uh, some of these, let's say, uh, voice uh, to increase the voice uh, from from the field, uh, so to say. Any other uh, additional response from that uh, about travel restrictions, uh, increasing transparency during during COVID? Anyone else would like to share? Mm -hmm. Okay, if none, anyone, any other question, Kuram? We have about 10 more minutes. Yeah, Toba, I think it's, yeah. Uh, we have addressed all the questions and comments. So, yeah. Ah, so there's one question here, Simon uh, Obosi, it's an interesting question. Uh, Rizwan Bono, if you like, you can also try to respond to this. Uh, the question is the nature of humanitarian response. Eh? It goes back to the humanitarian response. Uh, it, it requires a lot of speed. You do things very quickly during the uh, response, during the emergency, during certain projects. And this often creates the possibility of accountability issues such as wastage, fraud, uh, fraud, corruption, because you want to get things done, then sometimes the mechanisms are not 100% in place. So that gives more 
um, let's say, uh, opportunity for some of these um, wastage and fraud to happen. So how do you ensure speed? How do you still reach out and do quality service? But at the same time, how do you mitigate these accountability issues? I will quickly respond and then I'll ask uh, Rizwan and Bona if they want to add. Um, so I think this, uh, Simon, what we, what we think uh, in a way, what I think is, uh, this is what I call pre preparedness. If the organizations do already have in place some of the mitigation measures and are prepared, then some of these steps can be cut short. So, for example, if you already have a selected, let's say, a uh, few tenders, the few tenders, a few uh, service providers that you know and you have gone through the proper selection and you maybe you have three or your top three, top five. So during the humanitarian res uh, response, you don't need to go through all the steps of um, going through the tendering process because you've already shortlisted. Similarly, even with staffing, with some of this hiring process, there are quite a lot of resources out there and you can find it also in uh, our CHS uh, Alliance um, website where uh, you don't need to go through the interview processes such a laborious one month because you can't afford to do that. What are some of the must do things? So there has been quite a lot of discussions around that also. So you may want to take a look at that. So the, the uh, all in all, there are some efforts, a lot, some efforts where uh, organizations, where uh, networks have taken measures to develop guidelines, to develop certain policies, to shorten the process without compromising the quality of the service. Okay, so uh, Rizwan Bono, Bona, do you want to add? Sorry. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me properly? Yes, we can hear you, yeah. Yes, I just want to uh, strengthen what has been said about the preparedness. I, I think to do that very well is to, I, I will go back to uh, uh, the idea of scenario uh, uh, planning, because yes. uh, this is yes, what- Yes, thanks, Uma. Uh, I would uh, like- Rizwan, so, Bona is speaking, yeah. Bona is speaking. <laughs> Can I continue? Yes, Bona, go ahead. I'm sorry, both of you have to fight for this. Go. Yeah, it's, uh, we, we know about the technology. Sometimes it helps, sometimes it can be uh, challenging. So what I, I, I'm, I'm focusing on um, uh, strengthening the idea of preparedness to, to be prepared and do it before and also have a different scenario. As, as you said, uh, Uma, for example, Clearly, say if the situation is in this uh, is like this, this is the the normal procedures, and have something in that procedure that can be can be um, lightened in another uh, emergency si uh, situation without compromising the transparency and anti fraud and all these things. This is one thing. The other one is also. Why, when we are applying the CHS or we are going through CHS verification, you will need to, to make the system robust beforehand to, to make it uh, uh, feasible for uh, emergency. We don't need to wait for emergency and then being, um, uh, being in trouble with the speed. To, to do something. So if we have planned everything very well, and as you said, the guidelines and policies and the, the procedures are very well uh, uh, put in place, we can uh, uh, diminish the, the difficulty in continuing being accountable and, uh, and transparent in the emergency situations. This is what, what I would like just to add. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bona. Rizwan, now you can go. Uh, thank you, Uma. So I was uh, just wanted to say that uh, when we are in emergency situation, definitely there are different uh, aspects and problems and challenges, but there is uh, no excuse to few things. For example, if there is uh, something that you are creating more harm than better, then I think uh, you have to think about either you shouldn't do uh, or support communities instead of creating more harm. For example, if your response is creating more sexual exploitation and harassment, if your response is creating more fraud and corruption, then I think these are the things where you need to see that uh, instead of creating more harm, you should uh, step back. 
uh, this is what uh, uh, what's my opinion and i see it thanks thank you thank you both thank you both i think bottom line is it is a journey and it takes a lot of uh, uh, it takes some uh, effort, uh, resources, commitment to get uh, prepared. I just want to encourage um, uh, those who are here. I'm sure some of you are in different stage of that journey. And a lot of uh, the changes that's required, sometimes it doesn't take too much money, monetary uh, investment. Huh? It takes a lot of more changing mindset, commitment, that kind of changes. Uh, which I think is sometimes within uh, our control. So I also wanted to uh, say that uh, with this mainstreaming, it takes sometimes you would have done all the steps, one, two, three, four, all you have completed, and then suddenly you see you're back to step one, two, three again. <laughs> That's the nature of the game. But if the foundation is strong, if the systems are there, even if you change staff, you you, when, when other stuff come, the culture is there, the system is there, automatically it will at least continue uh, to the extent that it can. It only uh, changes, it becomes very challenging if you rely 100% on certain staff, particular staff, and then when that staff leaves, all the knowledge, skills, everything is taken away and it is not institutionalized. So I think that would be my uh, personal takeaway from this accountability mainstreaming. I personally enjoy it very much because uh, no one organization is the same. Uh, no one organization has the same entry point. But um, the interesting part about mainstreaming is once you uh, put the systems and policies and the practices in place, you can really see the change. Uh, as I said earlier, that would benefit uh, everyone. Okay, so with that, uh, if there, are, I don't see any other comments or question, I have... Um, enjoyed the session, although I'm only looking at myself and Kuram occasionally, some boxes. <laughs> I, I'm assuming it was useful. So I'm going to give it back to uh, Kuram. And uh, thank you very much. I'll see you uh, next month on a similar topic, but with a slightly different uh, format of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Kuram. Thank you, Rizwan Bonner, for adding a lot of input today. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you, Ma. And uh, now we are uh, as proceeding to the end of the webinar. Before that, I would like all of you to just vote to the last quiz. This will help us to actually structure our role uh, and support in Asia because like we are the member of uh, ADRRN and as member, we are also hosting the Q&A hub in Asia. So we would like to uh, know more about how we can support and how we can extend our role to the members in understanding the standard in ensuring uh, quality and accountability to, in their interventions to their communities. So please, uh, the poll will be on, on your screen. So kindly feel free to vote. While you attempt the poll, I would also like to share some of the, some important dates to be remembered for the next few weeks as part of the 2020 Regional Humanitarian Partnership event. We will be having a thematic event on safeguarding, no act apply on 26th November. Then we will be having another thematic event on how to make complaint response mechanism participatory responsive. It will be on December 2nd. Then on December 14th, as uh, Uma was mentioning, we will be having the second part of uh, mainstreaming and it will be on, is accountability truly embedded in organization core values and activities? In this, we will be also be having some voices from the donors, from the INGOs and from the local organizations. So we will be discussing like, what is accountability and how it is embedded in organization core value at different levels. So, join us in this web webinars as well. You can take a mint or two to attempt the polls.
the poll is on on your screens. If you can't see on the screen, kindly go to the polls. There you will find the polls. Yeah. Thank you. I hope you can see the polls and you can attempt it. Right, Zena? Thanks, Suma, the Rizwan, and all of you for your thoughts and sharing. Yeah. Welcome, Pura. Thanks, Mona, for your sharing. Uh, uh, Mona, uh, Pura, could you share the poll results either now or email it to me? And Mona is also interested. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So. On behalf of CWSA and co-organizers, ECWA, ADR, and OCHA, including all the valuable members who have participated today, I would like to thank you all for your time and commitment to promote quality and accountability for the principal humanitarian actions. There is a lot of debate on the development side, so we will be taking that also into account. This was the first webinar of the series CWS is organizing. So you have seen the dates for the future webinars as well. We will be sharing the invite with you. So please feel free to attend all those webinars and feel free to share the invite with your colleagues and your partners so that they can also benefit from, from these learning opportunities. The inputs and the contribution you made through these webinars and also in the future webinars will help us to shape the policy paper to be published as a result of these regional humanitarian partnership events. We will be having some other events uh, through other partners as well. So we are really grateful to all those who have shared their questions in advance and also to those who have raised their concern and their questions in the chat box and in the Q&A box that really help us to identify a few of the aspects that sometimes kept missing. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be part of uh, this learning program. And hopefully we will see you in the future events as well. Thank you very much for joining us today and hope to see you in the future webinar as well. Thank you. Stay connected and stay safe. Goodbye for now.